What we want to do today is we want to pick up our discussion where we left off last time. We were talking about present value last time. And if you'll remember, we had an original formula that related how much money would an investment or a savings account and so forth, how much would that grow to over time? And our formula looked like this, where the future amount of money in that investment is the amount that we start off with, and then we basically grow that by some amount and the amount that it grows by is one plus the interest rate or the rate of return expressed in decimals, 4%, 0.04, and then T would be the time, the number of years that that money is working. And we don't take anything out in between, we just leave it there and it works for one, two, three, ten, however many years, and so then we've got a number up here like three, if that's three years, okay? And so that showed us the effects of this growth we start off with this money, P dollars, and then it grows over time according to this formula. Okay. Then what we did is we took that and basically divide both sides of the formula by 1 plus I to the T power, and we turned this into a statement about present value equals the future dollars from the investment divided by 1 plus I to the T power. And so now, in this particular case, when we started off, we know the amount of money, P dollars, that we start with today in our investment, and we're interested in, what does it grow to? The real question we're trying to answer is, what's the future amount of money in this investment? But now what we are doing is we're recognizing that in some investments, we know the future amount of money, and I'll put a subscript there, T. We know the amount of money we're going to get T years down the road from our investment. And what we're trying to do is calculate how much is that worth today to me? What's the present value of those future promises? Okay, and then I sort of looked at that sort of as scales where we've got some future dollars and some present dollars and we're trying to basically weigh those off against each other where we know this amount, the future amount, and so how many dollars do we have to have right now to be of equal value to us? And the way that we, the scales work is it, it deflates, it div divides, it discounts those future dollars. And the discounting is greater the more years that we have to wait to get the money. That is to say, what makes the denominator larger? One doesn't change. The, either the I or the T could increase, and that would mean there's more discounting that takes place. So the longer we have to wait, the more we discount those future dollars. And the higher the interest rate that we apply, the discount rate, some people would call that, okay, then the more we deflate those future promises in calculating their current value to us. Okay, so we have this formula. Present value is the future promise divided by one plus I to the T. And I've written that several times now, but for good reason. This is a fundamental tool that all investments, as far as I know, all investments have this kind of a formula applied to them. You don't have to, but then you don't have to make wise investments. But if you want to make a wise investment, this is the analysis that goes along with wise investing. And here's why. With investments, there's always the prospect of getting some money later and you always have to put some money down now. And you're always trying to figure out, how much should I put down in this investment you know, to make this worthwhile? And so every investment, there are no investments where you put your money down now and get it back now. It's always put it down now, get it back later. There are no investments where you basically, what, get your money later and then go back and retroactively put down a certain amount. You gotta hand your money over now and then you're gonna get something back later. Is it worth it? What kind of investments? If you go out and buy a house and it's a rental house, you pay the money now for the house, you get rent in the future, right? If you buy a stock or buy a bond, you hand the money over today for the stock or the bond, you get something back in the future or at least that's the prospect of getting something back. They could go bankrupt and not pay you but the intention is to get something back in the future. Is it worth it? The amount you have to pay today? How much would you pay today for that house, for that stock, for that bond? 
How about a college education? You go to college. You spend tuition now. You buy books now. You withdraw your time from the labor force where you, know, you could be working, but instead you're sitting in class. So you're incurring costs today in the present to get something back in the future. It's an investment in human capital. All investments have this deal where you make an investment today to get something in the future, and now you have to be able to compare those dollars. Is it worth it? And a present dollar, today's money, is always more valuable than a future dollar. Okay, so anyway, that's why this problem arises. A few notes about this, a few comments about it. One is this. That future amount of money, you might say, I know this, but we don't know for sure. This is really an expected amount of money. Now, we have reasons to believe, strong reasons to believe, boy, I am going to get that money. And I have no doubt, you know, but what you're correct. But if you go to college today, you might say, hey, I know if I go to college today, get a college degree, I'm going to earn more later. You know that? You know that? It can't be any other way? You don't know that. You think that. Vast experience tells you that. But you know what? You could go to college and incur a lot of costs, go through graduation, get your diploma, say, boy, I feel good. Step out on the street to go get into your car and somebody run over you. And then what was the payoff on that degree? Zero. Now that doesn't happen to many people. But the point is, it's always expected. You buy some stock or some bond, General Electric, AT&T, IBM. You buy stock, you buy bonds, and you go, oh, here's what, what General Electric's going to pay me in dividends. Or here's what General Electric's going to give me as interest on this bond. You know that? General Motors or General Electric could fail. I, I'm not predicting that. I don't expect it, but they could. And even if they don't fail and just go out of business and say zero for you, even if they don't do that, they could have some bad times and just say, gosh, we're only going to be able to give you half of what we expected or a third or whatever. This is always expected. And if we have a very, very, very strong reason for believing some number, okay. The best thing to do, though, is... You know, like if you're buying some stock or some bond or you're, you know, whatever your projection is for that future income, you'll recognize how much risk is attached to your, the future value that you put uh, to those dollars, those future flows of income. Okay? Now, here's the deal. If you have a very, very high degree of certainty attached to a number, then when you do that discounting, then you should use an interest rate down here that is a very, very certain type of an interest rate. Right? Uh, we'll talk about risk later on, but what we find out is this, is that the people who loan money to the United States government, they say, boy, the United States government's going to be in business for a long time in the future, 10, 20, 30 years for sure. We don't know that, but that's the presumption. And they are not going to default on that debt. And so when people loan money to the United States government, pretty low interest rate. But if you take a company out here and maybe what you're doing is selling ice cream, you know, and there's a lot of other people selling other ice cream and maybe just as good, maybe superior ice cream, better hours, their stores are open, you know, and so forth. Then you go into business and you say, hey, I want to sell some stock to somebody you want, or sell bonds. I need to borrow some money. And then a person who's investing in that business, they go, you know, this is not a sure thing. And so when it's not a sure thing, they might say to you, I promise to give you blah, 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 a certain amount of payment on these bonds. If you'll loan me $1,000, I will pay you 15% every single year for the next 20 years. They might promise you that. But then when you put an interest rate down here, it should reflect the amount of risk that you're running in order to get that. And the risk is considerable if it's somebody that's selling ice cream that's kind of like not a superior product to everybody else's, then there's a good chance that eh, they won't be in business 15 or 20 years from now. It's not like loaning money to the United States government. And so 
There's risk attached to these numbers up here. Sometimes it's tiny, 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 and that's okay. And then, but all I'm saying to you is when you get a number in that numerator, then the interest rate that you use in the denominator is supposed to match the riskiness of those dollars in the numerator. Okay, so it's got to do that or you're not doing it right. And so what will happen is you go along and maybe somebody comes out and they've got news and they say, oh, our company, everything's been great until today and today we, you know, our competitor came out with a product that is superior to ours. Before, our product was superior. And now all of a sudden, somebody else has got a superior product to ours then the riskiness of dividends or interest payments or whatever just increased. And so now, whatever those promises were, they're being discounted by a higher interest rate. And so the value, the present value of that, that bonds value will go down or that stock value will go down as a result of that risk entering the, the equation. So anyway, these are things that we have to take into account. It's not just a matter of, do you have a calculator? Can you put a number in the numerator? Can you put a number in the denominator? And can you punch the equal sign? Yes. But to do the analysis, what you have to do is you have to know what to put in the calculator. That's really what's happened over the years, you know, is uh, students get these calculators, sophisticated calculators and computers, and the calculation becomes almost trivial, like, that's easy. Well, that allows students and their teachers to spend more time thinking about what goes into that calculator and having a better idea about how to do the analysis, the thought process that goes into it. Punching the buttons is an easy thing. Anyway, um, let me talk about, and then we're going to do some calculations here in a second, but let me talk about two or three things that affect these numerators. If we're talking about a stock, what's the return on a stock? Well, the price, you never know what's going to happen in the marketplace. The price is being determined. But if you own a corporate stock, let's say you have a share of General Electric stock, then what you get from that is a dividend. They mail you a check. Anymore, it's an electronic transfer. But they are mailing you a check every quarter saying, here's your share of profits or earnings is the term they'll use. And this is profits or earnings after they pay their taxes, what's left over. And if General Electric, and we'll just use an easy number, if General Electric earns, let's say, $4 billion in profits and they pay $1 billion in taxes to the government, state and local, then they're left with $3 billion. And let's just say, hypothetically, that there's one billion shares of General Electric stock outstanding. And you own one of those, one billion. Well, $3 billion in after-tax profits divided by one billion shares, that's $3 per share. And then, if they don't keep any of that, they distribute that to the owners, the shareholders, as a dividend. And so then, up in the numerator, what you're going to have is a $3 dividend. Hey, what if they don't give that to you? What if they say, yeah, we earn, after taxes, $3 a share, but we're only going to give you $1 a share, and we're going to keep the rest? Well, they don't keep the rest for vacations. You know, if they kept the rest, then what they would do is they'd say, we're going to take $2 per share and put it back into the company, and your company will be that much bigger in the future. And so these earnings either would show up as a dividend or as a bigger company in the future. We want to avoid, and then the bigger company in the future has value, but we want to avoid that entire discussion. We'll just say that whatever their profits are, that's what they pay out as dividends after they pay their taxes. Okay. And so then we've got this discounting thing, 1 plus I. What's the I? Well, it's an interest rate that we think is an appropriate interest rate to adjust for the amount of risk this, this carries. How, how likely is it that General Electric will be able to pay that $3 dividend into the future? And you might say, you know, 
It's a big company. Big company, they got lots of different products, right? They operate throughout the United States. General Electric selling something in every state. What products does General Electric sell? You know, they sell all the th uh, things all the way from light bulbs up to engines for jet airplanes. They sell hydroelectric, well, the equipment for these hydroelectric dams, these turbines that generate electricity when uh, water goes over the dam and so forth, and turbine spins and it generates power. They sell those, and they sell stuff all in between. And it would be called a conglomerate. The company is in many different industries. And uh, I think their general rule is whatever industry they're in, they want to be the number one or number two company in that business, the biggest. And so here they're operating in every state of the United States. They're selling a wide range of products. Not only are they selling a wide range of products, but they also have a financial division. They're lending money to people, sometimes their customers. Oh, you want to borrow some money from us and buy an engine that goes on your jet plane? Okay, we'll finance it for you. And then General Electric is doing business in many countries around the world, lots and lots of countries, not just five or six, many countries around the world. And then General Electric has thousands and thousands and thousands of managers that have been trained and have the skills to do their jobs. That's pretty safe. That's a pretty safe deal. They start saying, we're going to pay you $3 a year in dividends. That seems pretty safe. Now, is it as safe as the government staying in business and paying you interest on your bonds a year from now, two years from now, three years from now? Probably not that safe, but safe. And so if, and I'm just using a number here, but we don't just say General Electric's going to pay us a dividend one year from today and that's it, but a year and two and three and four and five into the future. And so what we want to do is we want to say, well, what is the likelihood that the government will pay us interest on a government bond? one and two and three and five and 10 and 15 years into the future. And there's some number. And let's just say hypothetically that the number for the government, that people are loaning money to the government for 4% a year, then we might say, you know, General Electric's a little bit riskier than that. And so we might use a little bit higher number. Maybe we'd use 5% for General Electric. It, we're using hypothetical numbers. But the point is that this is a thought process you're supposed to go through when you start saying, hey, General Electric's paying this dividend. I'm going to get that. I'm going to value those future dividends. And so then there is some risk factor that's built into this interest rate. It's the riskless interest rate, the interest rate for no risk, and then add a little bit of risk on for General Electric. If you're lending money to this hypothetical ice cream factory that's producing ice cream, it's no better than, you know, Dairy Queen or Hagen dazs or whatever, then there may be some interest rate that's 9% or 12% or 15 It just depends on the situation. Now, what you can do actually is go and see data are published for different amounts of risk. There are risk ratings, and I'm sure you've heard of triple A risk and double A and single A and B and so forth. We'll talk about that in the next chapter. But anyway, you've heard about those risk ratings, and so what you would do is go and see, well, you know, this is a, let's say, a B, A risk. And so what are bonds paying or what are lenders charging interest rate wise uh, for that amount of risk in the marketplace? And then that's what you would attach to this company that you are trying to value their dividends or trying to value their, um, their interest payments. So anyway, that's what we do. And then the next thing we do is here's our future payment. Here's the T. When do we get that money? One year from now, $3. But General Electric doesn't say, we're going to pay dividends one time, one year from now, end of story. What they say is, you know, another year from now, we'll pay a dividend again, and then a dividend again, and so forth. We're just going to keep paying these dividends. How long? What's the life of a company? Well, in theory, a corporation has an infinite life, right? Now, infinite, so will they still be doing this 600 million years from now? 
Well, yeah, if it's infinite, but probably not. But you know what? Infinite, when we start doing these calculations, we're just talking about getting our calculator out and putting all the numbers in, punching the buttons. 30 years is pretty close to infinite. That is to say, we are discounting, and let me come back to this, we are discounting, and so you get a future dollar and discount it by a number that's bigger than one, and it makes it smaller and smaller and smaller, the bigger that is. And I'm saying that once that T gets to be 30 or 40 or 50, this denominator is so large that a future dollar is not very valuable. Okay, so when we start talking about infinite, um, yeah, the company has this infinite life in theory. That's its theoretical uh, life. But a future dollar is just not very valuable when it's out there 30, 40 years from now. And you can just do this in your head. These interest rates, I told you you can go and do some research on this. But also, this is a personal discount rate. of the investor. So you just think about that for a second. Suppose I said to you, hey, you want a dollar? And you go, yeah, okay. I'll take it. And then I say, how about if I give you a dollar one year from today? And you know, wherever you are, I'll find you. I don't want you to, uh, we don't want to add travel or anything like that into it. But I just say to you, I'll find you. I'll give you a dollar one year from today. And you go, okay. But I'd rather have it now. Well, what if I say two years from today, I'll give it to you. I'll find you wherever you are. I'll give you two dollars or a dollar two years from today. Three years, four years, five years. What if I say I'll find you and give you a dollar thirty years from today? Wouldn't you go, who cares? I'm gonna forget this. Right? And so when we start thinking about this interest rate or this discount rate, you can kind of think about this in terms of how important that will be to you. If you're the investor, that's the appropriate interest rate to discount those future dollars. You're the one handing your dollars over, and it's your P dollars, your present value, that you're handing over for the promise of those future dollars. And so you can start thinking about how important is, is that to you. Okay, and so once something gets out there 30 or 40 years, it's almost nothing. And so, anyway, we don't really have to have this string of numbers that go to 1 million years from now, 2 million, 3 million. Right, And so let me put this formula up here again in slightly different terms. Well, let me come back to this. Here's the 1 plus i to the t. We'll assume that we're using a 5% because I use that as my example over here. We'll assume that we're using a 5% discount rate in this story. So then this would be 1.05 to the first power because we're waiting for one year and then 1.05 to the second power because we're waiting for two years, and so forth. Right, and so now what do we have? Present value is the future promise divided by this one plus i to the t power. Okay, why don't I get the calculator out and do one of these? 3 divided by 1.05 equals $2.86. So if we wait or if we try to value that dividend two years from today, that $3 dividend, its present value to us is only $2.72. And that dividend three years from today, $2.59. And be sure and tell me if I make an error on these. And that dividend, what would it be, four years from today, is worth $2.47. So what we're doing is, you know, most people say, oh, look, I've got a share of stock, GE share, one share. You might see it in those terms, but you know what? That's just a piece of paper. And we've even gotten to the point now where there is no piece of paper. This is all electronic. So even the piece of paper is just a hypothetical now. 
But even when you had the piece of paper, the piece of paper was kind of like a dollar bill. Who cares? What I really care about this piece of paper is it's going to throw off these dividends of $3 a year forever. That's what I care about, is getting a $3 dividend. And so what are those $3 dividends worth? And now we're calculating present value, future divided by the discount factor, 1 plus i to the t power equals the present value. And now what do we do? Well, we add them all up. Add them for how long? Into perpetuity. When's that? It's forever. Well, if it were a bond, a bond is a loan. It has a specific maturity date. It could be a five-year bond, a 10-year bond. Next door over here, there's a parking garage. And when that parking garage was built, the university had some bonds printed up and sold those bonds to investors. And so what those bonds say is, we'll pay you interest each year, let's say $3. We'll pay you interest each year for the next 10 or 20 or 30 years, whatever it would be. And then there's a bottom line on that. And then you finally just say, that's it. But on the dividends, there's no that's it. This goes on forever. And so our formula, I'll use a little bit of notation. It's slightly different. The present value then is equal to the sum of, so we've got a sigma sign, t equals 1 to n. Well, Let's not put in, let's put infinity of the future dollars. I'll put a T down here. 1 plus I to the T. And this is the sum of notation from year 1 to infinity. Now, any time that it doesn't go out to infinity, that it's 10 years or 20 years or 30 years or whatever that would be, we would add all those up. And then each one of these dividends, well, each one of these future payments has a present value, and then we would add them up. And this number right down here is the present value of that stream of payments. But if it goes to infinity, it's easier. It seems like it would be harder, doesn't it? It would seem like, oh my God, I'm just going to be adding these numbers up forever. But it actually gets easier because at that point, this becomes what is known as an infinite series. And at that point, what we have is this. Just that. It's the future, the annual dividend divided by the interest rate. So in this case, 0 0.05. And what was this, $3? And so then the present value of all those future dividends forever would be 60 bucks. Okay. And like I say, if we have something that doesn't go forever, then what we have to do is calculate the present value of each future payment and then sum those up. If it were a bond, let's say what we had is a five-year bond and that five-year bond, let, uh, let's say, is paying us three dollars a year in interest and we go through, through the same discounting process, then What do we have? Um, I think this would be two dollars and thirty five cents for the fifth year. Now, if hypothetically this were a five-year bond, it would look something like this. Here's a bond. It's $100. 
then they're paying a 3% coupon each year. And then the maturity date would be five years hence. And so what we would get from this bond would be a series of payments, five of them actually, and then also in year five, the bond would mature and we would get back our $100, our face value of that bond. And so now here would be a $100 payment. And then we would say, hey, I'm gonna get not only $3 that year, but also five, or also 100. I discount that. I believe that's right. Then we would add all these numbers up. Has anybody been keeping up with this? And then what we would say is, hey, this bond has a present value to me. I'd be willing to pay for it right now, $88.87, assuming I haven't made a mathematical error. Did anybody else do the calculation? What am I paying you for? Anyway, but you, you get the point of this. The bond is a loan. We loan the money to, if it's General Electric, here's the money. How much are we lending it? We're going to give it $88.87. And they give us this piece of paper, the bond. And what this piece of paper says is this. Hey, we'll give you $3 a year for the next five years. It's a five-year maturity. There's a 3%. They call this the coupon. coupon interest rate. Here's the maturity date five years from now and then here's the par value or the maturity value or the face value. Three different names for the same thing and that's the hundred dollars. And so what we've got now is a piece of paper that's a contract and it's a promise. And General Electric would be saying, hey, we promise to give you $100 five years from now if you'll buy this piece of paper from us. I'll give you $100 five years from now, and every year between now and then, I'll give you $3. And so that piece of paper, as I say, is a contract, and that contract is in year one, one year from now, I'll give you three bucks. Two years from now, $3. Three years, four years, five years. Five years, these are really, they would come in a single payment. But the reason we lump them up is we get them on the same day, five years from today, discount each one of these payments to present value using the 5% that we decided, our personal discount rate that we think is appropriate for this money. We discount those dollars and then add them all up, $88.87. Yes, sir? But you wouldn't make an adjustment for it? What I would make is 5%. Yes, and what I'm saying here is this. I'll let you use my money. It's my personal discount rate because this is my personal money I'm handing over. I'm willing to let you, under the circumstances, I've thought the situation over. I see your company. I know what you're involved in. I see what you're promising me. I am willing to let my money go to work for 5%, not 4.99, 5%. Of course, I'll be willing to let it go for 6%, but 5% is the least. And so if I decide that's what my money's got to earn, then... What I say is, you know what? I'm willing to hand over $88.87 right now for this promise. I would not let you have $88.88, no. Because if I give you one extra penny, I didn't get my 5%. Okay? We will pick up with this next time. This is a fascinating subject, so be sure you're studying this. So long.